good afternoon. First, good afternoon uh, to everyone who joined us today in the first lecture of the series on the archaeology of the Levant. Um, before I start, I would again like to thank Pascal and Les for organizing this lecture series um, on a short notice and for inviting me to present our project in Jordan today. Um, as the site that we're presenting, uh, Tel Usher, in, um, for, for the non-Arabs, is not well known. I would like to start by introducing it a bit and showing the results of our excavation so far. I will then uh, briefly say how um, these fit in the general picture of the Southern Levant and the Iron Age. And um, the second half of the talk will be dedicated to our documentation method showing how we include as much computational solutions as reasonable and as feasible and how we combine that with let's say traditional or analog documentation tools and why. Um, my presentation is hence divided into three parts. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? What are our research questions and how we are doing it? So starting with what we have been doing, um, the Tel is located in Northern Jordan, uh, three kilometers west of Irbid where the red dot is on the map. Um, you can also see on the map some of the other possibly more familiar Late Bronze Age and Iron Age sites in the surrounding area for a better situating it. It's a freestanding mound, as you can see on the picture, and it has never been systematically excavated before. Um, there has been few modern disturbances. Um, there is no recent buildings, no modern buildings, no modern cemeteries, and no agricultural activities on the site itself. Um, quite interestingly, walking on the site surface, one can identify a building remains immediately under the topsoil, and these are visible everywhere. And given these favorable working conditions, um, the project was launched in 2018 in cooperation with the Department of Antiquities in, jo in Jordan, and it is a project of the uh, Freie Universität Berlin. And the project director is Dominic Bonatz. And since 21, we have funding from the German Research Foundation or the FG. In 2018, we conducted a preliminary investigation, which included a systematic collection of service potsherds and finds, um, which allowed us to identify specimens dated to the Late Bronze Age, the Iron Age, Hellenistic period, or later. Two visible segments of the fortification wall were cleaned that you can see in the pictures at the bottom. These were not excavated, these were simply cleaned, so you can see how visible they are on the top of the tell. And on the top right, you can see a small sounding that we dug on the northern slope of the tell to try at the beginning to probe into the stratigraphy. This was complemented in 2019 with the geophysical prospection in which um, the course of the fortification wall was quite obvious. And there is a gap in the east, I hope you can see my mouse where I'm pointing at, that might indicate the location of the gate. Um, the results from the adjacent slope next to the gate also, also showed a lot of anomalies, positive and negative anomalies, indicating walls or um, fills or usage surfaces. I would like to mention at this point one more thing. In 2021, our topographer at the time, Felix Volter, mapped with a GPS device all structural features that we evaluated as belonging to the fortification system. So even before we excavated, we had an idea of how this fortification system looked like. Uh, you can see that it is completely circular on the top of the mound, and it's an alternation of wall segments and massive buttresses. The um, circumference of this um, wall on the top of the mound is almost 175 meters. To the east, um, it opens up with what we think is the gate location, and in front of the gate, we have protruding structure that I am pointing out right now, and um, a ramp that could lead up uh, from the north towards the gate area. These, like the ramp and the um, protruding structures, were also identified in the geomagnetic survey. At the foot of the mound, we have two rectangular rooms that we call watch rooms or towers, and they were pros possibly to protect the entrance to the mound uh, if coming from the east. 
So as the aim of the current project phase was to investigate the fortification system, we defined these three excavation areas that you can see here on the plan. And, um, and we were not disappointed because the remains of the fortification system were found in all three of them. In area A, in the segment of the trench, which is located at the upper edge of the slope. So I'm just going to show you where area A is again. So we're talking about this segment. Um, we found the walls immediately under the topsoil. We have almost an eight meter long stretch of the fortification wall and the picture on the left, and then a perpendicular buttress that comes out of it that you can see the top of the buttress in the picture on the right. Um, and the, so the, the stones of the buttress were interlocked with those of the, of the wall. So the two structures were built together. And the buttress protrudes by almost 3.5 meters from the um, surf, outer surface of the wall, and it extends for almost 12 meters. In the corner of the two structures, we could excavate 6.5 meters of the elevation of the wall that you can see in the picture on the right. And uh, almost 20 courses of the wall itself and 13 courses of the buttress. Um, what we noted is the irregularity in the courses of these stones with smaller stones used for leveling um, the, the courses of bigger uh, blocks of stones or boulders that were used. Also in area B, we excavated an intersection between a wall segment here and the buttress that also um, protrudes outwards. And like in area A, the two were built together and some of the boulders were fitted together. Um, just to note here, like the boulder I am pointing out now at the slide is two meters long. So this is quite a massive structure. Uh, we could trace here in this uh, area B, the fortification wall or uh, structure for 8.5 meters. And the wall itself here was found to be 3.5 meters wide, as you can see on the ortho photo, uh, sorry, three meters wide, as you see on the ortho photo on the left and the buttress 3.6. So the whole thing was 6.5 meters wide from outside to inside. In area C, at the edge of the slope, we also started excavating in 2022 to look for the fortification wall, which we quickly found. And it has um, more or less the same uh, construction technique as we have seen in area B with an outer face and a fill of stones um, in the core. And the surface um, to the outside of, of this uh, segment of the wall, we found a walking surface, which was partially paved with flagstones and partially plastered. And on the surface, we found like the block that I'm pointed out, several of the boulders that were part of the wall that collapsed. Um, we then superimposed these results with the results of the geomagnetic survey that you can see on the right. So the, the, the greens are the geomagnetic survey and the blue is what we traced with the GPS. And we can see that there is an infill that turns uh, inwards towards the tail, and this is where we expanded our trench in 2023. Um, so we had postponed this operation for quite a bit because as you can see on the picture on the left, I don't know if you realize how large this area is, we have a stone packing that almost covers 20 square meters and that consists of small and large huge stones. So we have been postponing this, although we knew that the gate was there. Uh, but in 2023, we decided to face this operation. Removing this packing broke the backs of the team members, including Lais and their morale at some point of the excavation, and it is still unfinished. Um, what was surprising to us is that within the packing, quite deep within the packing, we found uh, garbage. We found packaging material dated to, to 2012 or 2013, which means that this whole packing that we're trying to remove to uncover the gate is quite modern and it sits on top of the tail. And we, we're we still doing that. Um, but for now, we focused on removing its Western half, as you can see with the superimposed or the photos on the left, which is something we managed in one season and we were not disappointed. And as you can see in the picture, we exposed quite a long stretch of the wall so far. That's almost 20 meters.
a little bit more actually. And the northern part of the trench, just the picture on the right, exposed um, almost 5.5 meter segment of the fortification wall, has characteristics similar to those we found in area B, as I said earlier. So clearly the fine the fine outer face and the core fill of randomly deposited stones. The wall extension to the south, which you can see in the picture on the left, however, revealed three distinct phases. Um, that I marked with red and green two of these phases here in this picture, the third and later phase and the one that was least uh, imposing as a building technique well, has been removed. And But the wall in all its three phases stops um, north of our square intersection, turning westwards and then it turns um, south again until it reaches the buttress. Um, so here, this picture that you see is taken standing, standing from the buttress, and you see that the wall segment very close to the buttress exhibits very clearly the older two phases with hoon block, um, like that are the newer phase that are clearly discernible, and, and they are on top of the roughly worked blocks that are the earlier phase, and they have a different orientation. The pavement that I mentioned earlier that we found in the north, where I'm pointing at, was unfortunately here destroyed, so we didn't find it. And this is where the gate is supposed to be. Um, so always as we do not expect it to be. And, um, and so this pavement was disturbed by this Roman structure that you see here on the left. And once we removed it, there was no more pavements of the uh, stones of the pavement. The second ranch in area C, it's located on the slope and it exposed what we believe is the second outer wall that I am pointing at right now and part of one of the watch rooms that is abutting the outer wall from the outside. The second outer wall is in itself also a massive structure. It is 6.5 meters wide where we excavated it and it consists of two parts, a substructure of massive blocks that you can see the one that is marked is two meters wide and the, and the upper structure of smaller stones. We do not know yet if these represent two phases or two parts of the structures. Um, we haven't reached the foundation of the second outer wall so we do not have a date for it yet but we believe it was built together with the main fortification wall. Uh, the watch room in itself seems to have been built uh, over a collapse that you can see where I'm pointing on the picture on the left. And this collapse probably came from the second outer wall itself. So they, the builders of this watch room dug into this collapse and built this room. Um, the stump of the walls, so the bottom part of the walls, have similar building techniques to what we see on the mound itself. So probably it also belongs to the same um, fortification structure. However, this has uh, the structure has been used quite recently, um, namely in the end of the 60s and beginning of the 70s by the we think by the Iraqi military, and it has been uh, the walls re rebuilt and the floor. Uh, was covered with cement, which we had removed. And uh, because of this reusage during the 60s and 70s, then it was used as a dump and we excavated in most of the layers above this watch room, large quantities of garbage, of modern <laughs> garbage that uh, you can see here. But that is clear indication of the reuse of the room. Um, so we also have not only evidence for the fortification system, but we have evidence of extramural occupation um, that we found in area A and area B um, that are marked here on the slide. Um, in both areas, the excavated walls abut either the fortification wall itself or one of the buttresses, and which means they were clearly built later. Um, and finding these remains indicates that at some point also the area outside the fortification on the top of the mound was used. In area A, the remains consisted of a sequence of fills and floors superimposed by stone wall that you can see in the uh, picture on the left. Um, and in the deep trench that I mentioned earlier, where we excavated the whole elevation, almost the whole elevation of the wall, um, we found a fill of com compact dark soil with a mix of early Bronze Age and early Iron Age pottery, as noted by 
our pottery specialist, Yvonne Helmholtz, who's listening to us today. Within this layer, we found this broken and badly preserved female figurine. Um, few of its features are still identifiable. It's nevertheless comparable to the Lady of Husaifa that you can see on the right. And we could carefully say that it also belonged to the common type of female figurines that was found in late Bronze Age contexts of the Levant and that is usually labeled as a goddess. This layer of, of fill was then sealed with a carefully laid cobbles pavement that you can see in the picture on the left. And on the surface of this cobbles, what we found was a fireplace and evidence of a temporarily like stone circle with fire that was um, in the middle and uh, burnt stones, burnt pottery, burnt soil. And the pottery shirts from the related context just above this fire contained some common late Bronze Age shapes, but mostly the pottery is early Iron Age ware. So we can say that the first usage of the area outside the fortification was the early Iron Age. Within this uh, soil that uh, had burnt traces, we found this beautiful seal. Mm which bears a geometric pattern on its concave surface and the figurative motifs on its rectangular stamp seal. Um, Dominic Bonatz published the seal in an article recently, um, and he describes it as a scarab or scaraboid-like seal, and uh, he says that it seems like a typical local production of transition from the Late Bronze Age to the Iron Age which in this area would mirror the transformation of the late Bronze Age iconographic repertoire into the new Iron Age one. I'm not an expert in art history, so if you have questions about the seal, please ask Dominic Bonatz. Uh, the fireplace was followed by a walking surface, which consisted of this clay floor that you see on the left, close to the wall and the path paved with flagstones that you could see in the picture on the right. And at almost like half a meter from the wall at the same elevation of the paved path, we found an almost round and flat stone that was embedded in the clay floor. Mm -hmm. Then we think these are related together. Maybe the area outside the fortification wall was covered with something at this point. Um, then in the next phase, the whole thing was covered with a compact layer of um, clay and another clay floor. And we found very few pottery sherds, but they indicate also an Iron Age date. Um, what happened next was a collapse of the fortification wall that you can see where I'm pointing, um, that it was still not removed where I'm pointing here and the picture on the left. And this collapse at some point, this collapse spans like 10 meters down the slope. It's a massive collapse. Uh, and has a lot of pottery that we still didn't analyze, but we will get to that. But at some point, some of the stones of this collapse were reused, were like redressed, were re to erect the wall that you can see here and that closed off a part of the area outside the fortification wall. And this would be, in this case, the last occupation phase that we have outside the fortification wall. In area B, the situation outside the wall also had some evidence of occupation. Uh, we have two walls that abut um, the fortification wall, indicating also two phases of construction because these two walls do not belong to the same structure. Um, however, this wall and the other one making a corner are the same structure. Problem here is also the area we excavated was too small. The pottery we collected was too little but so far also evidence points to Iron Age. As I said, in area A, there was a huge collapse of the wall at some point and also in area B. So the collapse of area A is on the left, of area B is on the right. And the date of the collapse event or possibly several events of collapse still need to be determined once the pottery is analyzed and once the collapse in area B is removed. But nonetheless, we removed a part of the collapse in area A in uh, 2021 to probe into the um, occupation phase in the stratigraphy. And after a few deposit layers with mixed pottery, uh, we found a segment of a curvilinear wall that you can see on the picture here. 
And with the, um, in the context associated with this curvilinear wall, we found a lot of early Bronze Age pottery, namely and mostly of the so-called grain wash decoration. You can ask Yvonne um, later about that. But the wall architecture indicates we might be dealing with a vernacular curvilinear architecture, a type of buildings present in a vast area of the Levant, mostly during the early Bronze One. The wall we have, we can say, could be similar to Tal Jawa or Jabal Mutawak or uh, the non-excavated um, so-called sausage-shaped houses in the Lija region in, Georgia, in Syria. And we have conducted a dating on OSL dating on one sample taken from the layers associated with this wall. And we have a date that falls well within the EB1 or EB2, as you can see on the slide. We still need to expand this area um, to further investigate this early Bronze Age occupation, but we have a lot of deposits to remove that are sitting on top of it. I would like to take a step back here. As I mentioned earlier, um, we excavated a deep trench in the corner of the wall and the buttress where we have exposed 6.5 meters of the elevation of the wall. The point we reached in the deposit, and it's a single like the same deposit for almost three meters. We've reached elevation 547. It doesn't matter. It's one meter below the elevation of the early Bronze Age remains I just mentioned. This observation, along with the readings of the pottery we have so far, lets us to a preliminary interpretation of the relation between the fortification with earlier strata. We currently think that following a hiatus after the early Bronze, Sometimes in the Iron Age, the builders of the fortification initiated a massive construction project, which involved digging deep trenches into the early Bronze Age levels, followed by elevating walls and buttresses at the same time while heaping soil to artificially raise the mound. I should note that this understanding of the sequence comes only from the insights we have from Area A. We need to look into other parts of the tell to make sure this was the case everywhere, and this is not only the case of Area A. And also I should note that the soil used for elevating the level of the mound, so what we dug out from this deep trench is probably more than what the original builders dug out from the early Bronze Age layers. So there's also a chance that the pottery we are collecting from these deposits layer do not come from the site itself. So the late Bronze Age pottery we have there and the early Bronze Age pottery we have there do not indicate an occupation phase of the site. Now I would like to move to the intramural occupation, which was excavated in area B indicated on this slide. And here under the topsoil um, of the trench that was covered with a collapse, probably from some intramural walls. And the pottery collected from this collapse was, has been preliminary analyzed and the majority is skewed towards the later Iron Age. And um, we can say mostly most of the forms are food processing and consumption. And interestingly, we found a large, very large number of grinding tools, grinding stones, broken shirts, parts, even complete ones, which fits well with what we think could have been the last um, usage of this area of the tell in the last occupation phase, during which we have identified four so-called silos or stone-lined pits that were probably used for storing food. Um, one of them that is here in the picture on the left, abuts the fortification wall, which means that the fortification wall was visible or was somehow identifiable when these pits were created. And in this one, we found this bead, it's a glass bead um, that we think is from the um, so-called Phoenician eye bead type. It is however corroded. We don't know if we can clean it better to make it nicer, but we will see. Unfortunately, the pottery from uh, the two silos we excavated, so the one on the left and the one on the right, was not in large quantities and uh, we didn't find so many diagnostics, so it's not so conclusive. During this phase, um, probably during this phase, a corner of the room was closed off with a curved wall and then the collapse above this corner, we found the two only complete forms we have so far, which are these two jars. Um, the exact date is not so obvious, but they are dated to the later Iron Age by Yvonne. 
from an earlier phase, we have a badly preserved floor and an associated tanur that you can see on the left. That for those of you who work in Jordan know that sometimes we have to deal with looting. So this tanur was dug out for us during the night before we could excavate it. So we couldn't really excavate it. But we recollected all the material that we think was inside the tanur. And from this material, we could restore cooking pots. And um, the, the material that comes from the tanur dates uh, generally to the Iron Age 2B, as you, you can see on the slide. And so these were the last two phases of a sequence we are still excavating and we will continue excavating next year. But the hole is located to the west of this very long wall that we have excavated so far for eight meters and we haven't found a corner. So we really do not know if we're in an area outside or inside yet, we will see. Um, so putting what we have so far in a larger regional and chronological context could provide some insights. Here we see the fortification system with the excavated segments marked with this dark beige color and uh, where we indicated also the missing parts or the parts that are not visible that are projected with the um, hashed uh, fill. But we haven't found an exact parallel to our fortification system so far. But looking at the single element, we could find a parallel is mostly in the larger southern Levant. You can see our wall on the right. The wall itself seems to belong to the so-called wall with towers type that starts appearing in the Middle Bronze Age, but is very common in the Late Bronze Age and mostly common in the Iron Age. In this type of massive walls, towers or buttresses are built into the wall and project circa three meters from the wall surface. We have 3.5, it fits perfectly. Such walls were found at the sites indicated here, for example, Jezer, Tel Nasbe, and Lachish, and at Hazor and Stratum 5. Um, closer to Tel Osher, um, fortified Late Bronze Age and Iron Age settlement have been found, for instance, at uh, Tel Jofie and Tel Zara, and further south at Tel Jawa and Tel Omeiri. However, they do not show similar features. So we do not have any site in Jordan so far that has an exact similar feature. There is one site being excavated now by a team from Finland and the Yarmouk University that could have a very similar structure to Tel Osher, but I'm not going to tell you more before they tell you more. Um, so a dating of our fortification system on typological grounds alone is not possible. If we look at the gate area and how we think it could have been, and we compare that to other gate complexes of the same period, we also have some interesting remarks. So we have this um, structure that jets out in front of the gate and then turns like closing off an area outside the gate. This can be compared to the bastion or um, to the gate courtyard of Lachish that you can see in the picture on the left. So there's also a corner that is outside the gate parallel to the outer face of the fortification wall. There is a, sim a similar structure was found at Megiddo or at Beersheba. Um, we, of course, do not know, and we're sure that the scale of our gate is much smaller, and we do not know how the structure of the gate looks like, and if we have a gate house at all, if it's two chambered, four chambered, or six chambered. But this we hopefully will understand in the next excavation seasons. Um, so now after presenting like a report of what we have been doing so far, I would like to have a look at the wider geographical area. So from the onset of the early Bronze Age, the North Jordanian Plateau has a very extremely interesting settlement history. But of interest to this project, as you noticed, is the late Bronze Age and Iron Age developments. Um, looking at the larger scale at the like West Central Asia or Near East region, we, there's a process of internationalization um, during the late Bronze Age that reshaped the cultural and political landscape of the whole region, which led inevitably to the rise of large states and their collapse and the transformation into what is known as the Iron Age um, small kingdoms of political and social systems. The area on the North Jordanian plateau between the Zarka River in the south and the Yarmouk River in the north has been so far for this period understudied. The two sites in the vicinity of um, uh, Tal Ushayar, namely Tal Irbid and Tal Hassan, 
could have been center of the region with far reaching connections, very probably. But for the period of interest, they are under researched because they simply cannot be excavated. Tal Irbid is under the modern structures, and Tal Hassan has been reused for a very long time. So the Iron Age layers are quite deep and difficult to reach. Um, the other smaller sites of Tal Fukhar and Tal Jofia provide insights about cultural and material development in the Late Bronze Age and Iron Age for the region. Tal Jofia, which we use a lot for pottery comparison, provides an important ceramic sequence. And Tal Fukhar could have evidence of Egyptian dominance and was proposed as Zarku from the Amarna letters. Again, I'm not an expert. It's just something I have seen. Other, other Iron Age sites were also excavated, like Tal Irmais or Tal Mghayar or Tal Jarash, but the publications that we have available so far are not really informative. Um, nonetheless, some of the material that made it to publication are imports uh, from ceramic assemblages and from finds, for, for instance, from Erbid or from Fukhar or from Jofi, which underscore the connections of the area or the role that this area played in connecting the trade from Syria to the Jordan Valley to the Eastern Mediterranean, also to Egypt. This indicates that the region was well integrated within a larger trade network of the late Bronze Age and Iron Age, but we so far know so little about it because it remains uh, insufficiently researched. And this is the gap we are trying to fill in the project. Furthermore, current reconstruction of trade route networks between the regional states is based almost solely on textual evidence, primarily the Amarna letters, and lacks really for the North Jordan Plateau archaeological evidence about how this network could have developed. Furthermore, most of the current reconstruction of the trade route bypassed this area completely, turning west at the level of Damascus. Although several localities to its south are mentioned in the Amarna letters, such as Busra and Pella. From a geostrategic point of view, the North Jordanian Plateau must have played some important role. It's located between the southern foothills of the Horan and Julan, and the north and the Jordan Valley, Aghor al Urdun in the west, and the vast desert steps in the east. So taking textual data, as well as the geography of the area into consideration, it becomes clear that this area must have played a critical role in the um, root system and that the settlement that existed there served specific function in the context of this global trade network. Which brings us to another matter of um, scholarly debate, if I might, I might say, namely the socio-political situation of the Northern Plateau. Was it under Egyptian rule? Was it under Neo-Assyrian dominance? Did that fluctuate? What about Gilead? What about the stories from the Old Testament and so on? We definitely cannot answer all these questions in our project, but we might have some insights and shed some light on some of these aspects. To sum up, what do we have and what does it all mean? Um, so Tel Oshair is quite close to the larger and more central Tel Erbid. It has a strategic, strategic location in the North Jordan Plateau. From the site itself, you can see a vast area to the east, north, and west. It's also close to a possible pass of a possible trade route, collecting the north with the Jordan Valley and the sea further west. With that, it has a relatively important control location. Um, the earliest evidence of occupation is the early Bronze Age, and we know that the Tel was elevated and the impressive fortification was built most probably at the beginning of the Iron Age, and that the intramural area continued to be in use until the end of the Iron Age. We still have a lot of questions to answer. We still do not know um, what was the nature of the early Bronze Age occupation. We have so far no evidence of Middle Bronze Age material and only some pottery shirts to indicate a use during the Late Bronze Age. We still need to understand what happened, if there was a hiatus or not. We haven't reached the foundation of the fortification wall yet, so we still do not know when exactly it was built. But maybe this question we can answer in the coming seasons. And by excavating the gate and the adjacent area on the slope, we can maybe shed some light on the approach to the fortification system. We know so far that the intramural settlement was used until the end of the Iron Age, but we still need to refine this dating and to understand the nature of this occupation in, in, in its different phases. And uh, this might help us understand why this fortress was built all together and what was its function, its relation to other sites in the urban region and hopefully beyond. 
So this has been so far like the classical part of my presentation for today, which is like a report on our ongoing excavation and comparisons and the general research question. But I would also like to shift our attention now and our focus to the documentation method that we use, because as um, I said at the beginning, I'm also a computer scientist. So I have some um, passion for computer solution and digital archeology. span At the site in our documentation method, we try to explore like a fusion of traditional and digital documentation. What motivates us um, to employ this computational method is our documentation and research question, of course, be but because it also enables us to document differently, we can analyze faster and we can ask and answer our questions much faster, which would not always be possible without digital methods. Most of what we do and what I will show is certainly used by other excavations. We did not reinvent the wheel. We are not reinventing the wheel but we just try to adapt our experience and our knowledge that we corrected over the years. And I'm saying we, because what you will see in the next slides and what you have seen in the previous slide is not something I've been doing alone. It is something that's been developed with team members and with feedback from students and other people that worked with us. And so similarly to any other excavation, we started in 2018 by recording a topography and creating a grid system. But in 2018, so we were underprepared and we didn't have a drone permit. Um, so to do a 3D model of the tell, um, our topographer at the time, Matthias Kolbe, was very creative. And he walked all over the tell with the camera mounted on the prism pole and he used the box of the total station as a marker. He made many, many, many photos, which resulted in this 3D model that you can see patched here on the right. It's stitched together, this 3D model gives us a topographic plan. The resulting digital elevation is great as a starting point, but it could have problems because of the method it was created, like distortions, like doming, and so on. So in 2021, we were lucky to have a GPS device, and our topographer in 2021, Felix Volter, walked again all over the tell, but this time not with the camera on a pole, but with his GPS device. And he made uh, point recordings with, with a, like change of elevations, and which created another topographic plan. So all recorded points were then converted into a tin surface, which then was used to generate the contour map of the site that you can see on the right. So the final model covers almost 8.5 hectares, featuring an elevation change of 26.5 meters. We still have to compare these two models to see if there is actually a difference uh, using the two methodologies. But having the GPS device with us also allowed us to anchor our grid system to a widely used uh, coordinate system, which is the UTM36N. Um, and to move away from a local system. This, of course, allows us um, to add commonly available data, like to put Google Maps or whatever in the background. But we can also integrate the results of uh, the geomagnetic surveys, which were also anchored to the same coordinate system. Um, what I want to add here is like we have, we do use a grid system and we are aware that some excavations now try to move away from grid system and to locate trenches freely, which also sometimes are not oriented to the cardinal points. This method has its advantages, such as the fluidity with following deposits or features. But we, however, maintained uh, the 10 by 10 grid system as it facilitates our documentation methods um, like, doc like documenting the excavated material. And more importantly, uh, it helps with systematically naming and managing our data. Um, but we use this grid flexibly. So for general orientation purposes, um, we use areas that you can see here as ABC. Each area could comprise a certain number of squares that we define ourselves. And areas can be added as work progress. And we do follow the deposits and research questions by putting trenches within these areas that are not necessarily the whole square. So we just like make them larger or smaller. 
north to south, east to west, depending on our research question in the area itself. Moreover, for features that are not excavated, but just recorded, such as the tracing of the fortification system that I mentioned earlier, or the tracing of the many looting pits that you see here in orange, or of modern um, disturbances or structures that you see in yellow, we created a meta square, which is essentially uh, the whole site and beyond. Um, we use this one also, for example, to locate uh, water sources outside our um, tell by itself. And, um, and we use this UTM localization for everything within and the square and for outside the square, which allows us to manipulate all our data in GIS as we need it. For the documentation of excavation progress and collected material, we combine both analog uh, or traditional methods, if you want, with the digital recording methods. Um, trench or area supervisors have a handwritten field journal. And these, they can note everything from the weather conditions, their mood, uh, to their remarks about the excavation context. They draw daily sketches or sketches of specific features. They can glue printouts of our GIS plans, of our photogrammetries, and they can annotate those by hand. We find personal interpretations in these journals. We find remarks. And this reflects also the expertise and the day-to-day -day experience of the archaeologists in our record. The team on the field also fills information about context and forums and um, finds and collection on papers and so on. Um, although I must say that papers are slightly cumbersome sometimes, especially when it's windy, folders can be leafed through, they can hand, the handwritten information can be erased, corrected, annotated with side notes, and complemented with additional information. But everything from these field books to the sheets is also reread by those who wrote them to be entered in the database, giving them yet another chance at adding interpretations and making changes. So one might ask, why don't we just fill the database and tablets on the field? It's a very good question and a legitimate one, um, as it seems we are doing two steps that can be combined in one. But tablets on the field, from my experience, are not less cumbersome. They have their own cons. And from an end user point of view, and this might change with the next generation, studies show that we still feel more comfortable with paper and that paper to us is more trustworthy, accessible, and readable. And um, like, for example, a lot of us would prefer to still read a printed book on a digital copy. So by having both documenting by hand and then digitizing, we are combining these aspects with the ease of access, with the speed of access, with the searchability of digital data. Other things are documented completely digitally. For instance, um, we use the GPS device for the localization and shape of the recorded context. For each context, we make a recording of top, middle, and bottom line with the GPS. These are then imported into the database and assigned automatically to the context based on naming conventions and can be exported to GIS to be plotted and transformed into 3D data that can allow us to digitally remove each context again and see what was beneath it or next to it, etc. This visual geolocated data combined with the descriptive documentation and the recorded relation between the context, as noted by the excavator, are then combined to create the Harris matrix of the individual areas using YAD, which is a general purpose diagramming software. At the moment, this is a several step process, import of points into the database, export to GIS, creation of shape files, 3D visualization, creation of matrix. And this needs the knowledge of working and manipulating data in four to five software. We're now trying to streamline the process. So our database developer, Christoph Forster, is currently working on making the geo data and database directly readable from QGIS and to add the widget in the database to display the localization of context, finds, and collections. Planned for the future, and I don't know what near is this future, is also to automate the process of creating the matrix, starting from the re relationships rec recorded in the um, database. This can be achieved by using Y files, which is a library for integrating YAD and other software. But this is slightly more complex and um, needs more interpretation of data. This could help us maybe in interpreting locus groups, architectural units, phases, strata, and pottery dating. Um, 
but it also needs to allow man manual manipulation to give space for the person analyzing the stratigraphy, so it should not be completely digital. Another digital recording method that we make extensive use of is photogrammetry on the field. We produce photogrammetries of whole trenches or part of trenches on a regular basis, generally every second or third day of field work, starting from before we start digging to a final documentation. We use the 3D models to look at and show the excavated context from different angles that might not be seen in photos, which a lot of times helps to add more observations and make notes of things that might we might have missed on the field. The digital elevation models of the, the DMs or digital elevation models of these 3D models, um, especially of unexcavated areas, are used to predict the extension of specific site features under the topsoil, such as the walls and buttresses. Um, the georeferenced orthophotos produced from these 3D models are also integrated with the rest of the data in GIS to allow for layering of information from different forces, uh, sources to better understand the site. And the orthophotos themselves are used to, again, virtually peel off the sites layer by layer and look at things, again, where we have doubts, where we still need to look at something. But we also use them as a base to hand draw plans and sections that we then digitize as vector files. Here again, we chose to go back to hand drawings aided by technology. And no matter how good these 3D models are, shades and texture can give us false impressions of things that only the archeologist can correct on the site, looking at the features while drawing them. In a small site project scheduled for 2024 and funded by National Geographic, we plan Excuse me. We plan to go a step further with the usage of 3D recordings and modeling, this time for spatial post-excavation analysis, specifically for volumetric analysis. We will remove um, the collapse I have mentioned earlier in area B, but before that we will record the top and bottom interfaces of each collapse layer using photogrammetry, and we will record the whole mound with the um, drone. And this recording will hopefully enable us to calculate the volume of the stone collapse and based on that calculate the minimum original elevation of the stone walls. Um, and we also plan to um, have this method scalable so it could be used by other people if it works. Um, we did a small um, test of concept um, in 2023. Uh, one of our students did that for his MA thesis. <laughs> and uh, we will use the results of this test to um, shape our project for next year. Another member of the team will also, um, for his MA thesis, conduct a least cost pass analysis of the surrounding territory to determine the optimal location of an ancient route if it passed next to the tell which will definitely help us to understand the role of the tell uh, in relation to any undefined route that passed there. We plan also to do a viewshed analysis to determine what area was visible from the mound. As I mentioned earlier, by standing on the tell, you can see a vast area to the east, to the north, and to the west. Um, and we will combine the results of viewshed from several vintage points on the fortification wall to map the surrounding area. Um, in our excavation, we have developed and continue to do so a documentation methodology that tries to harmoniously combine traditional with technology-driven approaches while maintaining room for future expansion and integration of some emerging technology that we don't know, maybe AI, who knows, um, balanced um, methodology that respect both traditional approaches and innovations. We try to embrace the best of the two worlds, so fusing, fusing technology with computational solution, with traditional documentation. We believe that this could help projects be implemented more successfully and could contribute faster to our field by making publications and results um, available to the public faster. I would like to say that all of this would not have been possible without the contribution of every single of a member of the team for the last five seasons. And last but not least, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward for the discussion.